he's not here to do tonight, and I do apologize. I want to welcome you all. It's wonderful to see this lovely crowd. Uh, it's always great when we get to put out a few extra chairs. I think we have some guests and some new members with us, so I want to say welcome to everyone. If you have a guest with you, would you raise your hand if you're a member and have a guest with you? Okay, I'm going to want you people to introduce your guest, and I'm going to start back at the very back with Mr. Lundy. Uh, Bill Lundy here. We have uh, students from Lundy Christian Academy from uh, our history class that we brought here. Would y'all stand up, please, if you're here for LCA, Look the Moms and Dads? Fantastic that we have some. Am I getting too loud now? Okay. Fantastic that we have uh, the young people with us. We're just delighted to see you. Okay. Now, who else has a guest? Tonight, uh, I'd like to present D48 and his lovely wife, Victoria. So nice. great program to look forward to. I think I've got some more guests over here. Yeah, this is uh, my daughter-in-law, Sherry Ann Peak. Have I omitted anyone? We're with Elaine and Linda Lyles, but they're not here yet. They got to stop. That was a bad accident. <laughs> <laughs> so there's like four of us. Well, I said I'm getting credit for bringing everybody. <laughs> We've been known to do things in reverse before. This is not the first time. But we do thank you so much. Okay, uh, we're going to have minutes of the previous meeting. Our secretary, Linda Chambers. Regular meeting, November the 25th, 2014. Robert Brents opened the regular monthly meeting, which was held at the museum. Minutes of the October meeting were read and approved. Emily Shaw gave the Treasury report showing a balance in regular account of $3,187.13. The balance in the memorial fund is $910. A copy of the Treasury report is attached and made part of these minutes. Old business. Robert Rents called for the election of officers. He read the slate as presented by the nominating committee. He then called for nominations from the floor. Hearing none, he called for the vote. The nominating committee made a motion to take the slate they had presented. Motion carried. New officers are as follows. President Ellen Hester, Vice President Miller Greer, Secretary <coughs> Linda Chambers, Treasurer Emily Shaw. New, new business. President Rents announced that Larry Bentley and Scotty Tillery will remain on the board as members at, members at large. He also announced that Greg Gray was appointed by the board as volunteer curator. This will place Greg on the board of directors. He called on Greg to discuss the caroling at the fountain to be held on December the 11th, 2014 at 6.30 p.m. Greg stated that the Robinson family and Scarlett Wool would be providing music along with the carolers. President Rents reported on the new alarm system the board was, has voted to install as current system no longer working. He also quoted monitoring fees of approximately $60 per quarter. This was discussions of other works in long range planning. Old business. President Rents called for the election of officers, read the slate as presented by the nominating committee. Uh, then he asked for nominations from the floor here, and none were voted on. Motion carried, and all the officers were elected, announced just a few minutes ago. 
President Rancy introduced Bobby McAwes, a new member of the PCHS, and the person who will present the January 2015 program on the early Cherokee Nation. President Rancy introduced Larry Mad with the Pentop. Penhody Trail Group. Mr. Madden has presented the program on the construction and use of Penhody Trail. He also discussed other trails and their construction or planning construction. The meeting was adjourned by refreshments Emily Shaw, London Chambers, and Brenda Gray. Respectfully submit <coughs> Ellen Hester, Secretary. Wow. Are there any additions or corrections? <coughs> Move to accept as presented. I second. We have a move and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The minutes will stand as read. Uh, treasurer's report by Treasurer Emily Shaw. She's in the back. You want to come up? If I can give it back here, if everybody can hear me. We have, uh, we're in the process of collecting dues right now. We have some due forms on the table if you didn't receive one in mail. And if you'll note on the ones on the table, the PO box is 203, not 205. So make sure I get it. And we have $2,077.32 as of today. And in the regular operating account and the memorial fund, we have $985. There is a detail of all of the income and expenses. If anybody's interested, look it up. You're certainly welcome to. I don't think you want me to go through all that right now. Okay. <laughs> Do we? <laughs> I will say though, in unless the, they vote that they want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I will say that in the minutes it said the uh, monitoring fee would be sixty dollars a quarter, but it has worked out to eighteen dollars a month, so it will be slightly less than sixty dollars. So right. that's going to be a little something in our favor. Um, are there any uh, additions or corrections to the treasurer's report? <coughs> If not, it will stand approved as read. Uh, acquisitions, we're gonna ask Greg if we've had any new acquisitions. Okay, um, the last meeting we had, um, Larry Bentley and Angela uh, brought in a banner that hung on the street lights on Main Street during the uh, 76 Olympics. And Larry, if you would stand up and tell who, who owned that. I know it was your brother-in-law, I think. But no. That was the 1996 one. 96, well, that's what I thought. It's a matter hung on Main Street. My brother-in-law was the city commissioner at that time. They, somebody gave it to him. He kept it, and uh, he passed away a few years ago. And I found it in his uh, stuff he had left. So we decided to donate it to the historical society. Mm -hmm. They have it. Uh, we received a book from Henry County, and it's the Henry County Cemeteries. Uh, I haven't seen it. Uh, it's upstairs, but they they sent it to us to have in our uh, reference files. And I think Emily, they have information if anybody wants to buy one. Uh, yes, we will keep the information for anyone who wants one. They sent us one that we can have in our reference section. Yep. And then I do have the email and the mailing address for the publisher so that if anyone wants to buy one for their personal collection, if they happen to have relatives in there or whatever, then I can anyone here will be able to direct you to that. And they are $80 a copy, I believe, is what the letter said. So it was really a generous gift for them to give us right. one for reference for free. All right. And that's all the acquisitions that I have uh, knowledge of today. We're down to old business. Uh, the membership letters did go out in January. We hope we did not overlook any. We have had a couple come back that I think must have address changes that we're going to have to check on. Um, but if you did not receive yours, we do have the forms here tonight for your membership dues for the year. And we can take care of that. And also, uh, if you got your letter, you saw that I was looking for some participation on committees. I have had some response from a number of people, several people that are interested in doing research. 
And I'm hoping if they're interested in doing that, that maybe I can find a spot they'll fit in on committees as well. But if you are willing uh, to work in any area, just please let one of the board members or officers know. Um, was there any other old business, Linda, in those minutes? I don't remember any. Does anyone remember any old business? Oh, but there's one thing I want to bring up. Uh, Y'all remember this history book that was published back in the year 2000? Yeah. Uh, we got in a shipment of those. There's three boxes left. I got one box in from the publisher of them who printed them, the printer. They're $65, and I've got 12 books upstairs now. When those 12 are gone, I'm going to order another box. And then when that other box is gone, there won't be any more of those. They're $65. And if you don't have one, I love mine. I've been reading it for 15 years. And it's the big black book that says history of Polk County from 1851 to the year 2000. But it's a very good book. And uh, but we've got them in now. If you know somebody that's been wanting one, and the library did sell them, but they're not going to sell them anymore. And when I contacted this gentleman, he said, we've got three boxes total. And I said, well, I'm going to order one box at a time. So if you want one of those, you really need to get it. Because when they're gone, they won't print any more of them up. Is that the one Larry called? That's exactly yes. it. It's not the book that Larry wrote by himself. It's for a group of people here. And they wrote about the different families, the early history of Polk County. It's about that thick and about like that. Uh, about there's quite 14. a few references in there that Lacey Parker put in. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's what it is. It is the one Larry Carter edited it, but it was uh, people who wrote articles about their families or their family businesses or whatever in years gone by, and it's a compilation of the history. I meant to bring one down here, but, did, but we got them upstairs. <clears throat> uh, we have a number of things available for purchase and maybe by the next meeting we can get a price list posted somewhere in case there's anything on there that you're interested in because we do have several books pertaining to Polk County history in one way or another. Um, uh, any new business? I don't have anything except I do oh, want to have a couple of things that I want to run in with announcements. One of them is if you'll look on the table where the sign-in board is out in the hall, you'll see a sh beautiful colored sheet like this. This is a list of the programs for the coming year so that you can post it somewhere and if there's something you're particularly interested in or want to invite somebody to, you'll have it as a handy reference and I appreciate Carol Casey not only for doing the programs but we're doing the list well, for Joanne and I have worked on this together, Joanne Starnes, but I didn't have room for the November one because but we'll do another one. <clears throat> you know, they we just didn't have room to put that one as well. So yeah. Next time. Uh Joanne and Carol are two of our worker bees and I certainly appreciate them. Um and I believe Larry Bentley has a presentation. Would you like to come and do that now? This is from a Woodman of the World, it's the Insurance Society, and I'm president of the local lodge. And um, I asked them, we do projects for the community, schools, nursing homes, different things. And so I asked them, could uh, we donate to the Polk County Historical Society? And uh, I, I talked with the region man, and he said, yes, we could do that fine under. And uh, so I got a check for $200. Yeah, Great. Flag, an American flag to go on our flagpole is coming. They just ain't got to me yet. So I'll bring those as soon as they arrive. Thank you, Larry. And Good do, job. Do thank the powers that be at the Woodman. <laughs> we do appreciate that greatly. <laughs> Emily, do you have something? Uh, Ellie, some people may not have signed in, and we need you to sign in if you haven't done so before you leave. 
please we just like to have a count and that's about the only way we have of getting it so yeah us volunteers get paid for everybody that shows up <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll sign in and it'll double our salaries <laughs> As we said, Joanne Starnes and Carol Casey have worked together on getting our programs for the year, and I'm going to let Carol, oh, wait a minute, are there any other announcements before I let Carol introduce our program tonight? Emily, I was remiss while ago. I messed up, and I did not introduce John and Bonnie Carruth, and they will be your speaker on, in March. That's right. Yeah. Oh, and I do have one one announcement, and I guess it should have come under new business. Actually, I didn't make me a note, and if I don't have a note, I forget. We have been approached by uh, one of our members, one of our hardworking members, Mr. Greg Gray, who also is a very hardworking person with the Welch Fest in Rotmart. Um, and he has brought a poster that I will post the Welch Fest will be coming up March 13th and 14th, but it is also a... Re oh, sure. no. 20th and 21st. That was 2013. Oh, okay. <laughs> the dates I'm here are wrong. Yes. The 20th and 21st. Yes. I'm glad you called that or otherwise we'd have posted it just as it is. Okay. Uh, but it's also a request for us to advertise in the, uh, I assume it's program book? Yes, is that For the Welch Fest. Uh, it is a full page ad, which is seven and a half by four and a half is $50, a half page $30, a quarter page $15. And I would like to know under new business what your pleasure is on advertising at the Welch Fest. I make a motion that we go the full page. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? Greg, discuss. We have, uh, <laughs> let me tell you, um, ever since we started that uh, Welch Fest, uh, we have a history booth. And the I would not mind if someone else wanted to volunteer to help man that booth oh, during yeah. those two days as well. Okay, are we ready for the question? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> okay, the motion has carried that we get a full page ad at the Welch Fest. Okay, now, I have no other business if all minds are clear. Carol, would you come introduce our speaker, please? Our presenter tonight has just made such an impact on preservation of history in our area and throughout the state. He's been a busy man, and it's all been significant and just made an impact. I mean, he has been superintendent of the restoration for Barnsley Gardens. I mean, that sounds like a lifetime job right there. And then he um, was co-founder and director for the Rome Area History Museum, another enormous job. And then you know the 192 Stock Exchange building in Adairsville? He redid that. And he started a dinner theater uh, there as well. And I'm sure that just scratches the surface. But for 10 years in there, somehow he found time to study the Cherokee Nation. And he knows more than you will ever find from anyone else. I mean, he knows everything. You can go to the bank on what he said. He knows. And so, <laughs> but um, we're not only proud to have him as a member of our historical society but he is a cedar town navy native <laughs> so mr bob mcelwee after that i'm a little leery to start <laughs> and i see one of my school teachers in here one of the proudest ladies right here she's a wonderful lady and i really enjoyed Really? Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, we're all 16 tonight. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight I'm going to touch upon my research into the life and times of the early Eastern Indians. 
Now, through the years, I have read every book I came across from the Eastern Indians. It became obvious that many of these writings were written with little or no research. Well, this led to many years of research, seeking out their true history. I'm wondering what kind of grade I'm going to get when I get through here. <laughs> it turns out that the savages, at least in my opinion, were the English and early Americans, not the Eastern Indians. <laughs> Now, I've written a manuscript, which I may or may not ever publish, but I will leave a copy here so anyone that's interested will be able to read it. In its bibliography, it lists all the sources from which it was written. Now, unfortunately, even today, just mention the word Indian, and the average person conjures up an image of a red-skinned savage with paint on his face, straps of buckskin for clothes, a war bonnet of feathers, and living in a teepee. Well, when discussing the early Eastern Indians, nothing could be further from the truth than this Hollywood version of an American Indian. As director of a historic site, I often gave tours to school groups. During one tour, a young boy asked, where are the teepees? Well, this shocked me, to be honest with you. And I asked, how many of you think the Eastern Indians live in teepees. Did you notice that I used the present tense of the verb live? Well, all of the teachers, parents, and students but one raised their hand. I then asked this young boy, why did you not raise your hand, son? He looked rather disgusted and he said, no Eastern Indian ever lived in no teepee. <laughs> And he was, of course, correct. This led me to researching the history of the Cherokee. I chose these people because my heritage, my blood, is part Cherokee. Now, the early Cherokee, they were unique in many ways. Their statute and culture accented the difference between them and other Aborigine tribes or nations. Their complexion was olive in tone, not clay red like that drama up in Carolina. They were tall and they stood straight. They were strong built and furious warriors. Their nation spread from the Ohio River south to what is today Georgia and South Carolina. And their government was a well-organized democratic society. Well, the men, they were skilled hunters. The women, they worked their gardens, raised the children, and took care of the homes. Perhaps it's a good time to mention the primary weapon of the early Cherokee was the blowgun, not the bow and arrow. Okay. I know thousands of arrowheads have been found throughout this area, and some were shown to me tonight, that uh, these primarily belong to nations that were here before the Cherokee. Like the woodland? I'm sorry? No, I... I <laughs> I, thought you, I thought you wanted to slow me down. <laughs> Examples of these are the woodlands or the Mississippians or even the creeks in this area here. Now, Cherokee houses, they were built with a double row of poles with branches woven between them to form a holding surface for a masonry plaster. Now, this plaster, it was basically the same thing as what they used out west for the adobe brick. But here, the sunlight was insufficient to bake it into brick. Thus, they used it for plaster. The walls, they were plastered inside and out. The roofs were shingled with either tree bark or split wood, and often the inside walls, this has got me when I found this out, were paneled with colorful mats made of dyed strips of cane. Now, they were not all drab inside, obviously and many also whitewashed their new homes. Now they built a separate house for cold weather. These were cone shaped, approximately 35 feet in diameter and 15 feet high in the center. They, the floor on these were two to three feet below ground level and outside they piled soil around up high because dirt is an excellent insulator. Now, the same materials, of course, were used to build the winter and summer homes. They also built a hot house, which worked just the same as a finished sauna. Rocks heated by fire outside the structure were placed in the center of the house, and then water, then thrown on the hot rocks, formed steam, steam bath. 
Now some Western Indians also built hot houses. Some smoked local weed in them. But I found no evidence that the Cherokee, the early Cherokee, used theirs for any reason except to clean out the pores of their skin. Now this is usually after a ball game or another exercise. Now when the Cherokee got sick, they were treated by a shaman. He was not a witch doctor. He did not hop around waving gourds and shaking feathers or what have you and hopping. I have a list of the diseases that they treated and the herbs that they used to do so. Now the Cherokee Nation was, before the English invasion, divided into seven clans. A clan was one family and inter-clan marriages were not permitted. Each clan wore a headdress distinctive to their clan. Here's a new word for a few of you people, I bet. Some of, uh, they were a matrilineal society. You'll have to read my manuscript if you don't know what that is or look it up in the dictionary. <laughs> when a man married, he became a member of a wife's clan. All property was inherited from the woman. <coughs> At this time, let me dispense with a myth. There was no royalty among the Cherokee. I don't know how many times I've heard, oh, my grandmother was a Cherokee princess. Well, I'm sorry, but no, she was not. Okay. Now this came from the first English Lord who was sent from the House of Lords in London to come over and learn about the Cherokee and come back and give a report. During his report, he was asked, how about the women? Well, he answered, quote, they stand straight and regal as though they were royalty. Well, you know what happens when something is repeated from one person to another, and in this case, over two or three hundred years, all that remains of his original description is the word royalty. From this grew the myth of Cherokee princesses. Now, eagle and hawk feathers were considered sacred and only those appointed as eagle killers were allowed to hunt them. Sacred feathers were never, never used to make war bonnets, okay? They were awarded as medals for brave or humanitarian deeds, and they were wore down the back, never sticking up in the air. Now, some Indians did wear a headdress made of feathers, but not the Cherokee. Now, ball games were sometimes used to settle disagreements among clans and other Eastern Indians, but not always. Sometimes it became necessary to defend one's territory, then war, okay? A New Year's coming was celebrated with a new fire festival. The sacred fire located in the council house was extinguished and all fires in the village were put out. The fireplaces were then cleaned and prepared for a new fire then the festival could begin. Storytellers told of the proud history of their people. Then a ball game was played. Now this could last, am I that boring? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I got a big yawn up front. <laughs> I've been up since three o'clock. <laughs> okay. After that, a ball game was played. Now this could last several hours because unlike its modern version of lacrosse, there was no time limit. The team, the first team to score 12 goals won. Now when you got somewhere between 200 and 1,000 men out there playing, chasing one little ball, I imagine it took a while to get 12 goals. <laughs> After the game, dancing began. This lasted into the night. Then the sacred fire was relit. This signified the beginning of a new year. And all home fires were then restarted from the sacred fire. Now the Cherokee were curious adventurers. They traveled great distances from their home, visiting and learning from other nations. On their way they made lean-tos for overnight shelters, not teepees. They would bend small trees in an arc and secure them down. Vines and branches were then woven crosswise with the bent trees. The structure was covered with any material available and moss and leaves covered with deer skin, then served as a mattress. They were also a proud people. They called themselves the principal people, or the real people. They never considered themselves to be owners of the land. 
They were merely its guardians. The earth and everything on it belonged to the great spirit who lived in the seventh heaven. Now, being a Cherokee was a way of thinking, having a love of the land and a devotion to their beliefs. Heritage, some of you are going to disagree with this, but maybe by the time I finish you'll agree. Heritage was not originally a requirement to become a Cherokee. A sacred woman could approve or disapprove anyone's desire to become one. Now they believed there were seven levels of heaven. And when one died, they ascended in accordance to how they had lived their life here on earth. Seventh level being where God was, the great spirit. Now the art of storytelling, it has long been an honored method of both recording history and entertainment. But to be a Cherokee storyteller, a person must be taught by an elder storyteller. They must listen to the same stories being told over and over. Sometimes it took years until they could repeat them several times in the presence of their teacher without changing a single word. This way they recorded their history. It was probably more true than some of ours is. <laughs> That's the first national capital of the Cherokee was Atissa, or Chowda. It was located on the Little Tennessee River, and all government matters were handled there. The first government, the early government, consisted of a civil chief with a right-hand man, an advisor from each of the clans, a war chief who took command when war was threatened, and a woman's council headed by the beloved woman, who was sometimes also a sacred woman. Now, any tribe member could attend a session and participate in their proceedings. I want to repeat that. During their governmental proceedings, any tribe member could attend and participate. They could state their opinion and vote on all transactions. The majority vote of all present ruled. Can you imagine entering a session of our Congress and saying that you had an opinion and you wanted to vote? <laughs> You'd be laughed out of the room, wouldn't you? Well, much ado has been made of the Spaniard de Soto's visit with the Cherokee. The Spanish National Archives have a record of his travels and give a different story than modern English writers. De Soto and his men, they were received as everyone else coming in a peaceful manner were. They were made welcome and treated as guests. The Cherokee did not cow down to them. When I saw that in that drama in North Carolina, I about fell out of my seat. That upset me. Uh, the Cherokee did not. They even furnished them with a guide to help them through the hostile nations to the west. Now, DeSoto died on this continent. All of you probably know that. But his men, some of them made it back to Spain with his log. DeSoto also could not read and write. That's why he had the monk with him to record his log. Now years ago, I saw the drama in North Carolina. It made me so mad that the next morning, I went to the principal chief and complained. Principal chief, that's what they call their leader now. He informed me, quote, the cast and crew are actors from Atlanta. Not one of them are Cherokee. <laughs> And the drama was written by a white man. <clears throat> we know it distorts our history. But we get money from it <laughs> to help educate our children. Did you notice the hesitation there when he was trying to think of an excuse for taking that money? Now one trader, James Adair, yes, Adairsville was later renamed for him. It was not originally called Adairsville. He lived with the Cherokee for over 20 years, and then he authored a book. Oh, that was in the year 1700, circa 1700, when he lived there. Well, during my research, I was privileged not only to read this book, but to make copies from it. And the most interesting paragraph to me, and I think the most important one is this, quote, the Indians are highly religious. They call their God Yehovah. I believe the Cherokee are one of the ten lost tribes of Israel, and their God, Jehovah, is the same as Jehovah. Their religious rites are the same as the Jewish." End quote. He was there. He should have known. 
Okay. Now, people of the Jehovah Witness faith also have something within their writings. Uh, I was not able to read this, but it was read to me over the telephone by a cousin who is of that faith. She read, When Jesus was gone for two weeks after arising from the dead, he visited the Cherokee. Now, I did not present that as if though I believed it was true or untrue. I only am making you aware that they have that in their literature. Okay. Now, the English learned that the African chief would pay for the head of an enemy. Well, they modified this to taking a scalp in the right ear. Most of us used to think that the Indians started scalping. Hollywood got us into that. It was the English that first brought it to this continent, and it spread throughout what is now the United States. Yes, the Indians did it. The Anglos did it too. Now, the English would pay a creek for a scalp and a right ear of a Cherokee and pay a Cherokee for the same items from a creek. This, every society has a handful of people that'll do these things, you know, that will always do the bad if they get paid for it. Unfortunately, this caused these two nations who were previously friendly to become enemies. Now, the Cherokee placed a value on certain elements. Mines were located throughout their nation. But as the English slowly possessed, took over their nation, they closed and hid their mines. One gold mine located in what, in what is today Bartow County, Georgia, was said to be so productive that word of it spread far and wide. Now, it is said to be located near <coughs> Pumpkin Vine Creek, if any of you know where that is. To this day, treasure hunters still search for it. My friend and often partner, Ed Byers, unfortunately, Ed is no longer with us. He told me he had spent many hours with a metal detector along Pumpkin Vine Creek. No gold, plenty of artifacts. Now, the Treaty of 1721, this was the first session of Cherokee land. And those that marked their X's that day, little did they realize that this was the beginning of the end of the Cherokee Nation. In addition to cargo, English slave ships brought smallpox in 1738. Well, having no knowledge of this disease, the shamans were helpless in their attempt to treat it. Now, smallpox spread throughout, as we all know. Although the English had the means to help control the disease, they did nothing to help the Indians. In their way of thinking, the more Indians that died, the less they would have to deal with. After a couple of years, thousands of Indians were dead. I know some of you are thinking out there, hey, vaccinations didn't even start till 1796. Vaccinations that we know didn't. However, the Chinese had a method they called inoculation well before this. Lady Mary Wortley Mantagan had her son engrafted, that's what they called it, in Italy in 1717. And then she brought this treatment to England in 1717. So they did have a method of treatment. Now Anglos on this continent and others, of course, also suffered from this. When I was looking for examples to prove my point, about the English and the Cherokee, I found several, but the best I found was Boston. Boston had a population of over 12,000 in 1738. Well, of these, well over 5,000 were inoculated. The rest had either refused the treatment or it was not made available to them. Of those not treated, over 80% died. Of those that were inoculated, there is no recorded mention of any death, at least that I could find, and I searched hard. Now, the English officials and British Army that were in the Cherokee and Creek area, they were all inoculated, and I could find no mention of any of them getting the disease either. Well, during their battle with smallpox, the Creeks and Cherokee were at war. This conflict lasted for 30 years. In 1755, they met in what became the final battle between these two nations. The Creeks had fortified the south bank of the Coosa River, just south of what is today Rome, Georgia. The Cherokee entered the river in a full frontal attack. 
Why a full frontal assault, I don't know. Anyway, many were killed immediately, including their war chief, Kingfisher. They then overran the enemy's position, and after this, the victory was so complete, the Creeks abandoned the upper areas of Coosa. And yes, what is now Cedartown was once considered part of Coosa. Let me explain why Nancy was at the battle. Cherokee wives often accompanied their husbands to battle. Each warrior carried two single-shot rifles. All rifles were single-shot back then. When one was fired, he simply handed it to his wife to reload while he prepared to, look to fire the other one. Now this gave him a big advantage over his enemy because they had to stop and reload their own weapon before they could fire again. Now Nancy was rewarded for this and other deeds by being named Sacred Woman of the entire Cherokee Nation. This is the highest honor awarded by the council and she then set as equal to all on the council. In 1754, the French and Swiss, along with several Indian nations, declared war on the English. This became known as the French and Indian War and it lasted for nine years. Well, a couple of years into the war, the French made the mistake of attacking the Chickasaw, a close ally of the Cherokee. Well, they sent a runner for help. Strangely enough, at the time of the attack, the Cherokee were in council discussing, discussing whether or not to join with the French against the English. Well, this attack on their ally made up their mind. They had to fight the French. They rushed to aid the Chickasaw and their combined forces gave the French their first major defeat in this war. I'm going to repeat that. Gave the French their first major <coughs> defeat in this war. Now why that's important, think about what I just said. If the French had not attacked the, Cher the Chickasaw, I would most likely be speaking French tonight. Because the French had defeated General Braddock's British Army in the West. This was the entire British Army in the West. And they were moving to do so in the East when they were stopped by the Cherokee and Chickasaw. Now, George Washington, a British colonel at this time, and his Virginia militia, they were the last major obstacle in the East trying to hold off the French coming down from Canada. Washington spoke to his staff this quote is word for word as officially recorded. General Product's army has been defeated. We cannot expect assistance from England as we are also at war in Europe and Asia. Unassisted, we cannot hope to defeat the French and their allies. The Cherokee and Chickasaw have repelled the French in their area. I have sent an urgent request for their assistance. We must pray they come to our aid." End quote. Well, the Indians responded to Washington. They sent war bands to block the French supply lines along the Mississippi River and to contain the French from advancing there. War Chief Octenonis, I probably missed that, <laughs> led Cherokees north then to assist the British. When they arrived, the battle was already in progress, so they attacked. The combined forces of the Cherokee and British defeated or won the battle and eventually the war a few years later. Well, after this battle, Washington met with South Carolina's governor, Den Whitley, and the following quotes are once again exactly as was recorded officially. The governor, quote, My report says we, you have defeated the French quite handedly. May I report to England that you will now drive them back to Canada, end quote. Washington's response, quote, thanks to the Cherokee, victory is within our grasp. I can truly say that without their help, future generations in these colonies might have spoken French as their first language. Their cunning and craft cannot be equaled if they return to their nation no words can tell how they will be missed, for upon these people, the safety of our march very much depends. You see where I got that while ago about I might have spoken French. 
Well, after the war, despite all of their efforts, the Indians were still treated badly by the English, who still considered them as inferior. Now tonight, I have partially covered the Cherokee Nation from early times through the French and Indian War. As all of you know, there is much more to their history during this time frame. You can either research the rest of it for yourself, or read my manuscript, which fairly well covers their history up until the trail where we cried. No, I did not say trail of tears. The Cherokee called it the trail where we cried. Hollywood. As I said before, I will leave a copy of my manuscript with Greg Gray upstairs. In his three-page bibliography, you will find references covering everything within the manuscript and that I have spoke upon tonight. Now, I will attempt to answer any questions you might have. Yes, sir. What was the population? The population of the Cherokee? It varied continuously. And up until this point, we're talking here, there is no telling because there was no record of it up until the 1700s when the Europeans came over. I mean, what, approximately what was it when the Europeans got? I don't have any idea. I do know that it's uh, several times in my research I would come upon there was 17,000 Cherokee. There was 17,000 Cherokee. And then they'd come along that says 5,000 Cherokee. Well, during the smallpox, it cut their population in half, they said, or a little more than in half, according to historic records. Uh, now, when you get beyond the trail where we cried, there is population counts, and all of that is in my manuscript. But I do not know prior to the early 1700s. I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. The, the fight with Kingfisher and Nancy, was that, in, in what area was that fight? Are, are you familiar with the Coosa River as it flows through, as it starts in Rome, Georgia? Mm -hmm. In Rome, the Etowah and the Ustanala come together to form the Coosa. Yeah. Okay, right there at the foot of the big cemetery there. Okay, and that was where it was. Now my time is up, but I'll say something else right fast. Around behind the back of that hill there, there's another plaque about a battle. And another kingfisher was involved in that. That was between the United States and the Creeks and Cherokees combined. That's a falsified plaque, incidentally. But, uh, yes, ma'am. There was an archaeological dig in 1970s down on the King Ranch on the Coosa River. Would you like to know where that was? And I wonder if that was they, that was named after descendants. I mean, that, that was, they think that the soda came through this area and they found the, some Spanish... Um, a sword. They found a sword and, and some evidence that, that either it was traded into this area or he actually right. came through here. Uh, the archaeologist, did, I read everything he wrote about that. And according to what he said, he wasn't sure whether that was Creek or that was Mississippian. Yeah. So... Other than that, I don't know what to say. <laughs> yes, sir. Recognizing that we are close to the Big Springs, were their settlements expansive? Were they were they large areas, and did they farm and and live off the land, or were they nomadic and travel around? No, they did not farm. They're uh, up until this point. Later on, and that will be the next part of another presentation that's coming, <laughs> I believe, next month or month after next. Or something. Uh, anyway. No, it's in October, isn't it? October, I'm sorry. Uh, the ladies, they had gardens, and they did raise, I've got a list of about 12 vegetables that they raised in their garden. The men primarily were hunters, and they traveled a lot, and they also, of course, were the ones that built the structures and things. Did that answer your question? It did, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, did the Cherokee... Did they have like a money system or did they trade goods and so what did they trade? I found no reference period to any kind of money system. They did trade for various things. As I read in here, they traded to the Scots furs, bears oil, food, and uh, clay and pottery for such things as weapons, rifles, Something tells me I missed a page. <laughs> 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 right. Yes, sir. Uh, the Cherokee Nation, 
rifles and weapons of other kind, cloth, cattle. But it was just strictly a bargain uh, thing, or a barter thing, is it? What were their main food that they ate? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Would you stand up? What what food did they mainly eat? What food did they mainly eat? Wild game and many vegetables that you eat today. Yes, ma'am. Chief Van of the Van House. Chief Van of the Van House. Yes, ma'am. How uh, historically correct is all that? And where did he come into this era? Ma'am, that's going to be in the next, and I would be interfering with someone else's presentation if I talk about t <laughs> Are there any other questions? Well, I thank you, and I hope I didn't bore you too bad. Thank you very much. Very informative program. Um, I did think of a couple of other announcements. We want to thank Millard, as always, excuse me, for videoing our program. And I want to remind you that this program will be available in the near future, along with a lot of our programs from the past are available on DVD for $10. So if you have a particular subject you might be researching, you might want to check to see if we have a presentation from the past on that, or if you're interested in a copy of the one from tonight. We would love to take care of that. Uh, the sign-up sheet for monthly refreshments is also on the table, I believe, out where the sign-in pad was, and we need some people to sign up for refreshments in the future. We want to thank um, Angela Bentley for the refreshments that we're going to have when we adjourn. And I also want to ask if people, especially the back, oh, I don't know, three or four rows, would fold their chairs and let's stack them against the wall. Otherwise, we're not going to have room to mingle and talk and get to the food back there in the back. So if you don't mind some of you uh, stacking the chairs to the wall, I would appreciate that. Are there any other announcements that anyone can think of? If not, again, I want to thank you all for this great attendance. I want to thank Bobby again for that wonderful program, and we will be adjourned. <laughs>